and because it's right in the house, we're fatigued, exhausted. <laughs> I am Mike. Yeah, my voice is going too. I, I, I've got a spare voice sat beside me. There oh, good go. one. That's Hello. That's spare voice. I just I, got very deep here. <laughs> I, I haven't met your wife. Have you? Um, that's in case my voice finally gives out. We've got it written on scraps of paper. So I'm just chuck a heap of scraps of paper and... I see Jana. Jana's in the list here. Good to see you, Jana. Jana. Good to be here. Wouldn't she's not on my screen. Oh, here I am, Derry. Hello. Hi, Jana. Taryn's here. I'm wearing my 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 big earphone things today. You can spot me by the orange stripe. Oh, okay. And Monica from Calgary is is with us today. Ah. Liz, Liz from Cape Breton. Cap Breton. Cap Breton. Stephanie he, Schuller. He just disappeared. He said he was going to come back and start the session. But... Yeah. Hi, Taryn. Richard here. Hey, camera on behind. Hello, Richard. <laughs> How are you? Oh. How are things in Africa today? Oh, they're always good. Yeah. Always. Do you and uh, Yana know each other? Are you near? Do you live near each other? Yes. Yes. Yana is my introduction to the whole self directed education. Oh, good. World. Yeah, good. Good. Yeah. Hi, dear friends, everyone. Hi, Derry Hanum. Nice to have you all here this evening, this morning, this uh, afternoon gathered here to listen to our dear friend Derry Hannum. So before we move on to his session, I'll just introduce short introduction as usual of our dearest speaker. So Derry Hannum is from United Kingdom. He became the deputy head teacher of pioneering English community school where the school is a learning resource for the whole community and the whole community is learning resource for the school. He then beca became a school inspector. Where is your inspector cap, Derry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where he tried to support other teachers and schools with similar ideas. He has worked with many European school students, organiza organizations on the issue of school democracy, including OBSU, OBSU, I guess the European School Students Organization and FSS, the Finnish, uh, uh, FSS, the Finnish School uh, Students Organization, where the students led their own school democracy project. He successfully campaigned for the creation of an English school students association and has recently done the same for young people being educated at home. He argues that these experiences and qualities are exactly what the world needs at this time and for a future confronted with the demands of the fourth industrial revolution. But that most schools and school systems with same expectations that he describes as pioneers of possibility, exceptions that he describes as pioneers of possibility are not providing them. They are instead trapped in a factory production line model of education, which inhibits imagination, creativity, and learning. Today, we have Derry Hanum, and the title of his talk is, Another Way is Possible, Becoming a Democratic Teacher in a State School. He argues that young people are natural learners who need time and space to pursue their interests, to cultivate their curiosity, to be creative, and to collaborate with one another. Derry also has written a book. I think he recently re uh, wrote another book. So the link for his book will be provided uh, in the chat. Those of you who would like to uh, get it, uh, he will uh, send a copy. I think uh, with the code, uh, you will have about 50% uh, of that. Uh, some discount is available. So let's welcome Derry Hanum for this wonderful this session. <laughs> Derry, now oh, the mic you. is yours. 
Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, well, look, I must warn you that this lecture is not a lecture or a speech or even just a talk. It's, it's a story. And that still gives me the opportunity to say a lot. Anyway, another way is possible, becoming a democratic teacher in a state school. This is the title of my Not A Talk today and also the title of the book. I'll put a link into chat. It's a half price coupon code, $2, I think. And uh, if, if it doesn't work, send me your email and I'll send you a final draft um, free. And incidentally, <clears throat> if you do part with $2, it's all going to the organizers of the conference who've done a, such a fantastic job. <clears throat> Some would say that the title of the book is an oxymoron, that you can't be a democratic teacher in a mainstream school with things as they are, in England anyway, with the emphasis on test scores, prescriptive curricula, authoritarian hierarchical structures, behavior management, isolation room, exclusions, inspectors, league tables, high levels of mental illness in young people. We have the unhappiest young people in Europe, by the way, in England. I've often said that it's almost impossible to stop young humans from learning, but schools manage it somehow. Young people miss their friends during the pandemic lockdown, but not lessons on the whole. They did not miss having no choice, no control, no consent in their learning. So the book, and this not a talk, is the story of the evolution and implementation of two guiding principles in my mind. The first principle, student participation in decisions about their own learning, not just learning in more interesting project ways, based ways, about content provided by me, the teacher or the official curriculum, but real self-directed learning around the interests and purposes of the students themselves. You could call this self-exploring learning if you liked, as well as self-directed learning. The second principle, student participation in a democratic decision-making community the creation of a human rights respecting democratic context for the learning. And this in itself is a major source of learning about who you are as a person, about democracy, about citizenship. This involved attempting to create non-coercive spaces within a compulsory school system, which is substantially coercive, authoritarian and hierarchical. What Stuart Grauer in his talk on Monday called pockets of democracy. When I was at school learning about democracy and human rights, it was like reading holiday brochures in prison. Not much point unless you were about to be released or about to escape. I didn't know if it could be done, but I thought it was worth a try. I would become an educational opportunist without a clear plan, but with firm guiding principles and we'd make it up as we went along. Incidentally, that's the title of a lovely book by Chris Sigliano of Albany Free School in upstate New York. I would become what John Abbott called a responsible subversive. Anyway, the book's in four parts. The first, where did the ideas come from? The second, implementing them in a secondary modern school, where the children had just failed a very high stakes test. At 11, they'd been told they could either join the 10% to go to the grammar school and perhaps to university or the 80 or 90% of the secondary modern school, which would go into some sort of work at 16. The third part of the book is reflecting on what it all meant. And I conclude with them. How can state schools move towards becoming democratic learning communities? Um, something I talked about in uh, conference talks in Greece and Ukraine in the last couple of years. How can we prepare kids to cope with climate change and the fourth industrial revolution? Anyway, it all starts with my own school experience. My dad grew up in Dublin, was a bus driver. When I went to primary school, I was put in the top of three, supposedly the most intelligent stream at the primary school. But streaming seemed to me to be based on how big your house was. Apart from me and my friend Dave, the top stream class was mainly filled with posh kids from detached houses that had cars and televisions. The other streams came mainly from terraced houses, 
or poor council estates, municipal housing, these kids would go to the secondary modern school. It struck me as totally unfair at the age of about nine. Primary school was incredibly boring and tedious. We were preparing for this 11 plus test, even though you weren't supposed to be able to prepare for it. It gave me a thorough introduction to the English class system. Well, school never seemed to be interested in what I was interested in. It just seemed to want to make me feel anxious and no good at things. I passed the 11 plus. In fact, I got an interview for a very posh public school. Now in England, a public school is an elite expensive private school. I didn't get the place because when my father was given the form to fill in, it said father's occupation. And he wrote, none of your fecking business. So strangely, I didn't get the place, but I did go to grammar school. I remember being asked quite often at the grammar school, what does your father do? I was asked that when I chose to go into the Latin class and then when I chose it to go into the Greek class. Um, my father had said to me, you might want to be a priest. Well, I didn't have the guts to say none of your fecking business. Um, fecking is an Irish word, by the way, it's not the same as the rude version. So I just said, well, he drives the 47 bus that stops outside the school. I was top in just about everything in the first year and last at just about everything by the end of the second year. <clears throat> Nobody bothered to find out why. I was just told that I needed to pay more attention and stop daydreaming and having my own thoughts. The main thought that I had was, how the hell do I get out of here? I was bored stiff. Needless to say, um, I was not welcomed into the sixth form um, or destined for university. I left school at the earliest possible age. The best bit was learning to fly little aeroplanes with the air cadets. That was great. They were real planes, not, not, not toy ones. And then I learned to sail with our not very religious vicar where my mum cleaned the church. He didn't pay her much money, but I got a free place on his sailing trips. He had a system which I liked even though most of the other kids were from expensive private schools, I didn't like them much, but I loved the sailing. So every Easter, he would rent a fleet of sailing boats on the Norfolk Broads. Each trip, you moved up the chain of command. So by your fifth trip, you were skipper, captain. I must just put my captain's hat on. Oh, I've lost it. Never mind. Um, so here was me, 14 year old kid, um, with a crew of privately educated kids and I was in command. Now that doesn't happen often much in the English class system, but it, the idea I liked, the authority was based on competence. I really liked that. And years later, when I was an English school inspector, I spent two weeks at the wonderful Sudbury Valley School in Framingham, Massachusetts. I found something very similar. I was shown around the school by a 12 year old boy because the staffer and founder Mimsy Sadowski was busy with a parent when I arrived. He asked me which part of the school would you like to see first and I said well I'm a music inspector so can we go to the music room. I noticed all the instruments were in really good condition and undamaged. You don't often see that in, in the um, free schools. And there was a lovely grand piano. So I sat at the grand piano and started playing Satin Doll, Duke Ellington tune, one of my favourites. And the boy said, oh, Derry, you can't do that. If you do that, I'll have to bring you up. What's that? I said, I have no idea. I was beginning to feel very guilty. I'd only been in the school 10 minutes and I was breaking the law. Um, well, he said, you need to be certified to play the musical instruments at Sudbury Valley School. So I said, great, how do I get certified? Well, you have to be certified by a member of the music corporation. What's the music corporation? I said, ah, it's all the students and staff who play and understand how to take care of musical instruments. Oh, that sounded like a good idea. So I said, okay, who's in the music corporation? And he looked at me and he said, well, I am. He said, I, I play the violin. 
So I thought, well, you could have said that 10 minutes ago. Anyway, I said, great, will you certify me, please? What do I have to do? And he said to me, oh, play something you love. So I played Satin Doll, the same tune again, but this time he didn't interrupt me. He said, my, that's pretty, you're certified. And he wrote my name on a list. Years later, I shared a room at a conference with Mike Mattisu from Sudbury Valley. He told me that I'm still an SVS certified musical instrument player. Now, I love telling this story at official conferences in England because it says so much about the respect for young people's knowledge and competence in a structure that genuinely shares power and authority in the community of the school. It, Sometimes I have to spell it out to these people. Why is this an unusual event? But for me, it was very important. Anyway, school gave me no careers advice. So what was I going to do? I went to work at 16 until I became a teacher at 25. This was pretty dull. My first job, I was in charge of hundreds of posters for the London County Council Parks Department. Then I trained as a surveyor. The best bit of that was playing the piano in a band for three hours at lunchtime in all the pubs in the old Kent Road. I discovered a teacher's library though in the County Hat Council building and I started reading philosophy books. I couldn't get a ticket for the library so I used a carrier bag instead for borrowing books. Um, I always took the books back. It's quite dangerous though returning stolen books. Um, you might try it sometime. You're more likely to get caught bringing them back than you are stealing them in the first place but I read a lot of very interesting stuff. Then I worked in a democratic therapeutic community for mentally ill young people. The treatment was living together, speaking in meetings, no drugs, no electric shocks, no brain surgery. It was completely non-hierarchical. The top doctor down to the newest patient were all called by their first names and it worked. The readmission rates were very low with none of the side effects of physical treatments. I thought if this can work with, work with disturbed teenagers, why the hell aren't schools like this? Finally, I worked for Oxfam and gave talks about world poverty in schools. I discovered I was quite good at it and I started Oxfam groups in schools. So I thought this is it, I'll become a teacher. So I started teacher training now, this was almost totally a waste of time, but the turning point came when I argued with the behaviorist psychology lecturer. I said to him, I don't want to teach salivating dogs, that's Pavlov. I don't want to teach rats that pull levers to get food pellets, Skinner. I want to teach children. So we did a deal. If I stopped asking difficult questions and being a pain in the neck, he would let me create my own alternative psychology course. And I found some dusty shelves in the college library full of books by guess who? A.S. Neal, Homer Lane, John Dewey. Wow, the world lit up. At Summerhill, I read that kids could choose what they wanted to learn in the context of sharing in the democratic management of the community. It made total sense. Marco talked about this and said how it made sense for him. It was everything that my school had not been. So I couldn't wait for an opportunity to try it out. As a student teacher, my first chance was in a council estate primary school, a municipal housing. The year six, the grade six class teacher was ill, so the head teacher was delighted if I took the class for four weeks. It was Oxford, so there was no 11 plus. All the kids would go to local comprehensive schools. So I started by getting in early on the first day and arranging the desks and chairs in a circle. The kids arrived and were a bit puzzled, especially when I sat in the circle. I explained that they could either study and present projects on anything they liked, either individuals or in groups, or they could do the worksheets that I had prepared. The only condition was that they would present their project to the class at the end of my stay with them. I said we would start every day with a class meeting and make decisions by voting. It was a great success. 
the head was delighted because parents got involved and there's nothing head teachers like more than nice messages from parents. Oh, I got an A for that uh, teaching practice. I was quite pleased. And no, none of the kids chose to do my worksheets, by the way. <laughs> they all did their own projects. So I thought, this is it. I'm going to be a teacher. But my next teaching practice was in an authoritarian secondary school, and it was an absolute disaster. I took some history classes. And in one, we talked about democracy, and it led to a discussion about how the students felt about school. Word got back to the staff room. And I was told in no uncertain terms that I was not to try out democratic meetings, but get on with teaching the Industrial Revolution. And because of my unprofessional behaviour, I wasn't allowed to let the students prepare and teach lessons on bits of the syllabus they found interesting, which is what I planned. And I had a teacher sitting in the back of all my classes from then on. If I hadn't had a supportive tutor, who'd been very happy with my first teaching practice, teaching and I would have parted company at that point. My third and final te teaching practice was an even more exciting rerun of the first one. The class teacher was about to retire. He was an ex-army officer with a bit of an alcohol problem. And when I said I wanted to create a democratic class meeting and get the year six kids designing their own projects, instead of saying, over my dead body, he said, fantastic. I've always wanted to try something like that. We worked together brilliantly. And fortunately, the kids loved him for his slightly unconventional ways. They never found the bottle of whiskey that he kept in the cistern of the toilet in the staff room. Um, once again, the head was pleased, parents became involved, and we ended the six weeks with a class festival and I got another A. So I thought, well, I will stay in teaching after all. Then I had to go into the university for a year, which was Oxford for the final fourth year. Academically, it was amazing, though it was a cesspit of the English class system. What I loved about it, apart from earning quite a bit of cash playing in three university jazz groups, was that you could basically organize your own learning. As long as you turned up for your tutorial every week and handed in your essay, you could go to any lectures that interested you. You could ignore the ones in your subject if they weren't interesting. I studied history and politics. Things happened like you had to have a, I had to have an ex oral examination on the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. I compared him to Hitler and the lecturer who marked the paper was a big fan of Bentham. So that was a bit of a problem. He decided that either I was very original or completely crazy. So we talked it over in his room for an hour and eventually I got the degree. But I really liked that slightly eccentric side of Oxford and that stayed with me. So I had to find my job as a teacher. I just had my third child or uh, my other voice had had it, but uh, it was partly my responsibility. I presumed my job would be in a primary school, and I had some possibilities with a couple of progressive primary schools, but my politics said no. These progressive private schools, they've always seemed to me pioneers of possibility, and Summerhill was an absolute inspiration. But the state system was where the mass of kids were, so that's where I wanted to work. We had to change it. When I saw an advertisement for a humanities teacher in a secondary modern school to teach English, history, geography, social studies, and our religious education to one class for 60% of the week, I thought that sounds interesting. And I really liked the head teacher who interviewed me. I didn't tell him the whole truth about what I had in mind, but he already had some quite radical ideas like he wanted to integrate subjects, though he admitted that the heads of the subject departments were opposed to the idea. He appointed the head of geography from, from another school as team leader, and with some more new young teachers, we made up the first year humanities team of seven with a timetable planning hour each week. I was to have my own classroom for 60% of the school week, that I would spend with my humanities class. And for the rest of my schedule, 
I'd teach other history classes with older students, but in the same room. This gave me the three T's that I think are vital for democratic experimentation. The first one is T for time. There's got to be time for lots of talk, for a class meeting, for students to really become absorbed in what interests them without bells ringing and having to go to other rooms every hour. So time. The second T is team, not to be on your own, but to be in a team or at least some other teachers and try to persuade the head teacher to give you some scheduled planning time so that you can talk to each other. The third T is territory. So team, time and territory. You need to have a dedicated space with lots of display space and storage. So that was a good start. I got a job with three T's. Before the term started, the heads of the various subject departments all sent us loads of totally unconnected subject stuff that we were supposed to do. The team leader thought that as this was our first year, we should go along with it. But I knew that it wasn't really what the head teacher wanted. So I just kept quiet and decided to go my own way. On the first day, once again, I got in early and arranged the chairs in a circle and sat in the circle myself. The kids came in and joined us in the circle. I told them my name, my first name and my family name. And I told them that in our classroom, I was Derry, but anywhere else it would have to be Mr. Hannam because that was the rule of the school. I explained our five subjects, history, the past, geography, other parts of the world, social studies, how people live in communities, religious knowledge, what people believe, and English, how people communicate. A boy named David, who I'm still in touch with 48 years later, said that, he said, well, he was Scottish, I can't really do a Scottish accent, but he said, that includes almost everything in the whole world. Can we study anything in the world? So I said, well, I suppose it does. We'll have to think about that. By this time, several people in the class wanted to speak at once. So I got a book off my desk and I said, I propose that you should only speak when you're holding the book and that when you finished, you should pass it to somebody else who can then speak. Who agrees? Hands up. Who disagreed? Hands up. So we were voting already and making class rules. Fortunately, I made a lot of notes every night so the book is very detailed about the minutiae of how the class democratic learning community involved. We had a class meeting, a class court, very similar to the judicial committee in a Sudbury Valley school. It became necessary because once we'd made class laws and people broke the laws, we had to do something about it. There were endless class clubs, class newspaper, many, many student initiated cross curricular projects around their own interests. Many jobs were created. Over the two years together, everybody did something and a lot of people did several jobs. The popular jobs such as editor of the class newspaper or chair of the class meeting, class secretary, class treasurer were elected and all had deputies. The secretary minuted all class meetings and sittings of the class court. Everyone experienced chairing a meeting several times during those two years. Everyone learned to speak in meetings and not be embarrassed. Everyone learned to be assertive and to say what they really felt, but they were polite to each other. They even created a class tax system, which was a penny a week towards buying games for the class games club. I kept a pile of pennies in the drawer of my desk and kids knew that if they hadn't got a penny with them, they could take one from the drawer and give it to the class treasurer as their tax. The interesting thing is this pile of pennies, it never got stolen. It went down a bit sometimes and it went up a bit. So kids put pennies back into the class drawer after they'd borrowed some. Basically, I ignored the prescribed work from the subject heads of department as the kids needed the time for their self-directed projects. 
We just did a few of the less boring items for parents' sake, usually as project-based learning with the kids choosing which aspect they would study. Occasionally, I even taught a lesson and it was agreed that everyone would share their project in some way with the rest of the class. Often the results were printed in the class newspaper, which had an elected editor, and there were many sub-editors for different columns, such as sport, music, or fashion. We had a model railways column. It gradually covered all the walls of the room, and then the door, and then the blackboard, which I didn't use very much, and then the newspaper started stretching out into some of the windows, which probably wasn't healthy. Short story writing and poetry became very popular. The art and drama teachers became very supportive and used the kids writing in their art and drama lessons. Artwork illustrated the poetry anthologies that the class produced and sold to parents to raise money for the class fund. I've often talked about my first class and the effect it had on the whole school. And I've been told I should write it up a year or two ago, a couple of people pushed me into it. Alfie Cohn in the United States said it's really important that people who think about school in a different way should write about where their ideas came from. And Michael Fielding in the UK, he believes that there are rich radical traditions in English state education that are often ignored and insufficiently acknowledged. So he was very encouraging. So I sat down to make a start. <clears throat> and while I was doing this, an extraordinary thing happened. I was working on my work process and I had another computer on my desk on the internet and a face appeared on my Facebook screen. It was a 58 year old balding man who I sort of recognized. I'm Andrew from your class 1H. And I read an article by you in a teacher's newspaper the other day, and I googled your name and I've discovered you're still at it. He was in my class, for heaven's sake, all those years previously. It was an amazing piece of synchronicity because I was just writing about an incident in which he'd been involved. One day, the head teacher came to my classroom with some visitors and I wasn't in the room. There were 34 kids all working quietly on their projects. I'd gone to the library to help somebody else. The visitors were puzzled that the room was virtually silent without any sign of a teacher. <clears throat> Andrew, who was the class chair at the time, he explained that they were having a quiet time. This was a class law that said if five people found the room too noisy, they would put their hands up and the elected timekeeper would announce five minutes quiet. The class, <clears throat> if anyone spoke in a quiet time, they would have their names put in the class book. If they got their names in the book five times in a week, uh, they'd have to appear before the class court on Friday afternoon. Andrew went on to tell the visitors uh, that our teacher, Mr. Hannum, is a bit soft and we didn't have our class, if we didn't have our class government, it would be chaos in here. The head told me this with a chuckle, while at the same time telling me off for leaving my class unsupervised. But I said to him, <clears throat> they were supervised. They were supervising themselves. We were together for two years. Um, another one of Andrew, Andrew's projects, this particular boy, the bald man who'd appeared on Facebook, his projects had always involved transport systems when he was in the class. I told his parents that he'd get a geography degree one day. They were polite but doubtful, as this was a secondary modern school and nobody went to university. Well, Andrew said on Facebook, I did get a geography degree. And now I'm head teacher of a primary school, which I run as democratically as I can. And I train other head teachers into how to run their democratic schools. He was still in touch with a number of kids from the class, all in their late fifties now. Some have written pieces in the book and they remember the two years of being in the democratic class from when they were 11 to when they were 13. <clears throat> and they say it had a big, big effect on their lives. 
So when people rubbish these ideas, I've got a little bit of evidence from a whole lifetime of some of the kids in my class that these ideas do work. They recovered their confidence as learners after the dreadful experience of the 11 plus exam. Well, instead of getting fired, as I expected, <clears throat> at the end of the year, another parallel first year humanities class were also adopting some of the democratic ideas, class meetings, class rules, class court, class clubs, class fund, class newspapers, etc., etc., were beginning to spread around the other six classes. My class was a bit annoyed about this because they thought they'd invented all these ideas and they didn't see why other people should use them. But anyway, they had decided to carry the first year humanities experiment into the second year. And instead of getting fired, I got put in charge of the second year team, which was a team of seven teachers taking their classes up a year to take the experiment into what you would have as grade eight perhaps, but in at that time, it was the second year of secondary school. So that was seven teachers and 220 kids for 60% of the school week. All the other teachers were volunteers. Uh, the senior staff in the school had called this project Derry's Crazies, and I was able to appoint three young teachers from college. We adopted a pattern of democracy and student-directed learning across the whole year group. We created a second year students parliament. We hooked up with drama and art departments, plays, poetry anthologies, exhibitions from parents. The kids could move from teacher to teacher as all classes were timetabled at the same time in a row of classrooms next door to each other. We had the use of the school hall and teachers from other departments and parents would come and give talks to whoever wanted to go to listen to them. Class newspapers covered the wall space of every classroom. Kids for, could go to presentations in other classes if the presentation was of interest to them. One day we went to, uh, as a class, to give lectures at the local teachers college about class democracy. This was really quite funny. We planned our two hour presentations in some detail and I was told by the class to explain how it all worked to get the attention of the audience. And then everyone in the class who had a responsible job, which was just about everybody, would talk about what they did. Of course, the student teachers didn't want to listen to me, but they certainly wanted to listen to the kids. And it was great. We never had any difficulty filling the time. And I've met some of those teachers over the years who have memories of being told how to do class democracy by 12 year olds. We were written up in the Sun newspaper. Now this is a national tabloid owned by the Murdochs. I was very naive. One of the mothers had a brother who was a reporter on the Sun. Uh, she told him about her daughter's democratic class and how much she was learning as editor of the class newspaper. She asked me, if he could visit the class with the photographer from the newspaper and sit in on a class meeting. The class were wildly enthusiastic. So they were invited. I forgot to tell the head teacher and get his permission, but I've learned in life that often it's easier to do things and apologize afterwards than ask for permission beforehand, because I'm fairly certain he would have said no. In the week leading up to the journalist visit, something strange happened. A boy called Ian started breaking all the class laws. Now, he wasn't normally antisocial, but he was chair of the class drama club. When the day of the visit arrived, the men from the Sun joined our regular Friday afternoon class meeting. They answered lots of questions from the kids who were editors of columns in the newspaper. What's it like working on a real paper? then claimed the, the class court with Ian in the dock as the only offender. The photographer got his camera out at this point and suddenly it dawned on me, they were more interested in the class court than the class dem democracy itself. And that Ian had worked out the best way to get his picture in the paper was to get himself tried in the court and it worked. 
In fact, the paper were nice. The paper paid for a bus to take us all to London to meet the editor and the kids were presented with the first 34 copies signed by him to come off the press with our story in it. I was pretty nervous, but in fact, the story was friendly <clears throat> and supportive of democracy in schools as education for citizenship. There was a large picture of Ian and the class judges with me at the back with my hand up asking for permission to speak in the court. The head teacher was annoyed that I'd not asked for his permission, but he was very pleased because the parents loved it and told him so. So don't expect a quiet life if you become a democratic teacher in a state school. I have many more encounters with the press since and I learned a lot about how to deal with them and get them on your side. Useful because I'd learned nothing like that at teachers college. I realized that what we were doing was turning these kids on to learning in a remarkable way. And at the same time, they were learning to manage their democratic community. At this time, I was reading the work of Kohlberg and Gilligan about moral development. I'll close my story about this class by telling you about Jo, a girl called Jo. She has a chapter to herself in the book. And I do apologize to those who've heard this before, but I think it's an important story. In the second year of the class, we admitted a very troubled girl from a Romani family into the school. She'd been bullied and victimized in her previous schools and had become an aggressive bully herself. I decided to put her into my class as I thought they would be strong enough to control her behavior and might be able to help her. She made friends with some much older students in the school and began to bully and steal from younger ones. She never stole from anyone in our class though, because she was cautious about the class laws and the class court. Eventually the head teacher decided she'd have to be permanently excluded from the school as parents had begun to complain. My class found out about this. And one day after school had finished, I was walking back to our classroom and I met some students from the class. They said to me, Derry, we're having a class meeting after school to discuss what we can do to help Joe. You can come too, if you like. Well, I love that. I was supposed to be their teacher and they were telling me that I can come to the class meeting if I want to, which they'd called. So of course I went to the meeting. There was a long discussion. One boy said, we should be kind to her some days and nasty to her on other days, like not speak to her and see what works. Well, that was rejected as unkind. Eventually they decided they would do the kindest thing they could think of. The class captain decided to resign and so did the chief judge from the class court. And the class decided to elect Joe to both jobs. Now they were the most important jobs in the class in the eyes of the kids. The chief judge said that if Joe became a judge, she would realize what effect antisocial behavior had on other people. The next morning when she arrived, a special class meeting was called. Joe was told that she'd been unanimously elected to both jobs. She burst into tears and ran from the room. Some students went to fetch her and when she returned, she told everybody, Nobody's ever been kind to me in school before. Her bullying and stealing stopped and the head teacher was persuaded not to exclude her. It demonstrated to me that young people in the class had developed a mature and moral concern for each other through having real power and real responsibility. Through sharing responsibility and having the freedom to make real choices they had become responsible. They could never have grown in this way if they'd just been told what to do all the time. In the book, I also consider a dilemma that I've never really resolved. How much do you tell your bosses and your colleagues about what you intend to do before you do it, especially if to some extent you're making it up as you go along? As I said, it's easier to explain afterwards than get permission. But if you don't tell other people, you shouldn't be surprised with, that you, when you meet resistance, the heads of the subject departments who lost control of their empire through the humanities teams that were created, 
were very angry about it and disapproved. So I recommend think about who will be affected by what you plan to do and making sure you have cover from above and friends who you trust to work with you. Two together, so much stronger than two individuals on their own. Three is better. Four, mm, now you're motoring. This is all advice that I've regularly failed to practice, but I never got fired, though perhaps I came close to it. Parents were overwhelmingly supportive of these first two years, perhaps in part because it was a secondary modern school. They were thrilled to see the confidence to return, returning to the kids after the blow of the 11 plus failure. And this, of course, kept the head teacher happy. Head teachers love happy parents. My biggest problem came from staff who were unsympathetic to the idea. They were annoyed that this upstart only just out of his probationary year or because their subject departments were being undermined. On the whole, the kids had no problem at all with switching from the democratic atmosphere of the humanities class, 60% at the time, to the more authoritarian ways of the other teachers, maths and science, for example, but there were problems. I had a real problem because my class had a maths teacher who shouted at them all the time. I must tell you what happened. She shouted at them to be quiet and they just became noisier. This is what happens. Those of you who are teachers, you'll know this. You shout at a class and you just make them noisier. After some weeks, the kids decided they wanted to learn some maths. So they decided to have one of their quiet times in her lesson. So next time there was a maths lesson, Five hands went up and the timekeeper said, five minutes quiet. The teacher then shouted at them, why have you gone quiet? No one would reply, which was a bit naughty of them really, because it was a quiet time. The teacher complained to the union and I was reprimanded for undermining the discipline of a colleague. I apologized and told my class that they'd not made life easy for me. Um, and I was pretty fed up with what they'd done. So lesson, if you have democratic laws in your class, make sure the kids know this is just for your class if it's an authoritarian school. In my second year, the head asked me to create a student, a school council that was to include teachers as well as students. It was enormous. Over a hundred staff and student representatives the first meeting was smooth enough and heads of all the years had by now set up elected student councils and democracy was spreading through the whole school. But at the second meeting, we hit the rocks. Second year students asked why teachers were late for lessons. Fourth year students wanted to know why the marking of their examination coursework was delayed. Prior to the meeting, the union branch had decided that I should be disciplined for unprofessional behavior in allowing these issues to appear on the agenda as it meant that kids were questioning staff behavior. Even though the head had allowed these two items to appear on the agenda, well, that was fun. So if you choose to be a democratic teacher in an authoritarian school, don't expect a quiet life. The book finishes with a series of theoretical chapters in which I analyze what I believe was going on. I talk about love and the public service ethic, the importance of democratic structures, non-coercive relationships, etc., etc., etc. A lot of theoretical stuff at the end of the book. And the book concludes with the relevance of all this stuff for the present situation in England and I think elsewhere. And then there's an afterward couple of talks I gave in Greece and Ukraine about the fourth industrial revolution, the loss of jobs that it's going to bring, climate change and all that, etc. Oh, well, it was an amazing first two years of teaching. And after two years, I was headhunted to be the head of humanities in an enormous new comprehensive school of 2000 students in a nearby town. Here we had a special building where we could have 200 students of different ages at one time for 20, 25% of their curriculum with a team of 10 teachers. After three years, I moved to another school 
where we organized 800 kids into four mini schools of 200, each with eight tutor groups of mixed age kids. Um, that was interesting too, it was a community school. We used the community as a resource for the school and the school became a resource of the community. I eventually became deputy and acting principal of, all, of that school, but don't panic, that's another book, it's not in this one. Anyway, always the two guiding principles, self-directed education in a democratic and rights respecting community context. Then I became an inspector. Well, I don't wanna to say too much about that. The only good thing about it was that when the government tried to close Summerhill, I could work as an expert advisor to the Summerhill legal team against the inspectors. And of course we won. Henry uh, Redhead can tell you more about that, and Ian Cunningham, who's talking tomorrow, Ian got a team together to do an alternative inspection of the school. He doesn't call it that, but that's what I think it was. And we were successful in the court case. So that was the best bit of my work as an inspector. But since then, I've worked closely with state systems in Europe, partly through the Council of Europe. Um, and trying to bring the ideas of the democratic schools, these pioneers of possibility, trying to bring these ideas into mainstream school systems, because that's where most of the kids are and that's where the big change has to come. I suppose you could say I was lucky, but my advice to newly qualified teachers is do your best to make your own luck by choosing your first job very carefully. Too many enter the profession full of idealism and good ideas only to be ground down. And by the end of their first year, they've become cynics too. 50% of teachers in England want to leave the job within their first five years. And it's often the best ones who want to go. It's really completely tragic. So if you're thinking of becoming a teacher, don't take any old job. Look for words like Team, blocks of time, planning time, integration, cross-curricular, project-based learning, participation, student voice. But don't just look for these words, get beyond the words and go and talk to as many kids in the school as you can. As Wayne Jennings says in his brilliant book, School Transformation, and as I had learned as an inspector of over 200 schools, look beyond the shiny school mission statements that claim to be aligned with genuine educational purposes, such as we help our students become good citizens, but they don't give them any opportunity to experience democratic decision-making and all the power stays with the head teacher. The next one, we prepare our students for worthwhile careers in the future of employment, but they don't give them any choice or autonomy and they show no awareness that nobody works obediently rows in factories anymore and moves to an act, another activity in another room every hour when a bell rings. We foster lifelong learning, say these mission statements. Meanwhile, they bore the kids to tears and make them feel they can't wait to be finished with school learning, more like lifelong forgetting. And then the last one, we help every child to fulfill their potential. Yes, they do this by forcing them all through one size fits all subject based exam machines divided up by age with no control over their time or their learning. And many are designed to fail and to create anxiety in the rest that don't fail. It takes no regard at all for the interests and passions of each student helping them discover and develop their own identity. So read the mission statements with care. And thank you, Wayne Jennings, for that advice. If you find subject-based learning in short timetable slots, in single age groups, streamed by so-called ability, with no mention of students making choices in their learning or students designing their own projects or having the opportunity to follow their interests, if the school parades exam results and inspection reports as if they're what really matters, if it claims to listen to student voice, but the student council meets after school one time a term with no budget and an agenda that stops at toilet paper or the quality of the French fries in the cafeteria, if it goes on about behaviour management rather than intrinsic motivation, if the arts are squeezed off the timetable, look somewhere else for your first job. Even in England, there are a few public state schools 
will our more creative places who will give you the opportunity to explore uh, student curiosity, creativity. Mm. Well, if you can't find schools with the right qualities, what I say to people is you might like to emigrate to Norway or Denmark or New Zealand, <laughs> where the whole system is much more along the lines that I've been talking about. Anyway, let me conclude with three suggestions as to what can be done about our public school systems. And I wish we had the ministers of education here. They should be here. This is a conference they ought to come to. Firstly, governments need to create departments for alternative education within their ministries of education. These would, be, these would open the democratic private schools, the pioneers of possibility, to everyone by paying their costs so they would be free for parents. They would also, should also fund the creation of new democratic schools where self-directed learning or self-exploring learning can be a choice for all who want it. My second proposal for government is they should instruct all schools to introduce the 20% principle. 20% of curriculum time should be for all students to practice self-directed learning around their own interests and passions. This could be one whole day or two half days a week or just 20% of the time in subject lessons. Schools should create a 20% committee of staff and students to plan how this program would be organized and managed. This process would introduce the idea of students participating in serious school decision-making. Ideally, this should lead to the creation of a 20% department led by a teacher of assistant principal status and staffed by teachers from all subjects who chose to work in this way, thereby creating a team of experienced self-directed learning facilitators. It should have its own part of the school buildings, the 20% wing, where exhibitions and presentations of student projects would be held. An entirely new approach to assessment would be needed based on processes rather than finished projects. Failure would be something to be learned from and not something to be feared. And 20% of students of mixed ages would be in the 20% wing at any one time. So basically every kid in the school would have the opportunity to experience some self-directed learning opportunities. In one school that I inspected, um, some of the elective activities were led by students themselves. A parent told me that the children would get off their deathbeds to get to school on electives day. In fact, part of my job as an inspector was to check the school attendance figures for every half day of the week. And guess what? The highest attendance was always on electives afternoon. I checked the school's examination record and it was better than you might have expected for a school in such an area. A recent publication on the future of teacher training from the well-respected Economist Intelligence Unit, it's called Staff 2030, the Future of Teacher Training. It recommends 20% time for student-directed learning. It points out that the skills such an approach develops are precisely the skills required by the workplace of the fourth industrial revolution, which it describes as a post-industrial landscape where intangible forms of capital like algorithms, data and software are creating wealth. And these require new kinds of self-directed competencies in young people. Some forward-looking companies usually, but not always in the fast growing high tech area, such as Google, already provide staff with 20% of their paid workplace time to develop projects that interest them, even though they're not directly related to the company's projects. Susan Wojcicki, now CEO of YouTube, she created Gmail in her time, in her 20% time when she was working for Google. Her mother, Esther Wojcicki, is a senior teacher at Palo Alto High School in Silicon Valley. She advocates 20% time to introduce self-directed learning into the schedule. She argues she calls it innovation or moonshot time, where students are given the freedom to come up with their own idea of what they want to do, what they want to study and how they want to do it. This has led to the 20 time project spreading through more middle and high schools in California, 
under the slogan, your students will be future ready if you give them time. Pareto principle is interesting. It's named after an esteemed Italian economist, Wilfredo Pareto. It specifies that 80% of all consequences frequently come from 20% of the causes, asserting an unequal relationship between input and output. Well, I would bet that 80% of student learning would come from the 20% of student of 20% self-directed time. Of course, the democratic school movements have already reversed the 20 self-directed to 80 provided curriculum. In many cases, the self-directed time is 100% with no taught lessons, whatever, no taught curriculum. That's the Sudbury Valley model. This is precisely why I believe these schools are in touch with the future, while most mainstream school systems stagger on like collapsing dinosaurs. Its students know how to take control and responsibility for their own learning, how to be curious, creative, collaborative and communicative. It's how young humans are born to be, as Peter Gray tells us, until school systems get to work on them. In our democratic schools, our students also learn how to participate in democratic communities that are grounded in human rights, where they can create their own identities out of their personal passions and interests, rather than being defined by examination grades. And then as paid employment dis declines in the future, they'll be able to define themselves as unique individuals, not relying on full-time paid work as the basis of their identity. And it seems to me there'll have to be some form of universal basic income to support future democratic societies, but that's beyond the scope of this story and I really have nearly finished. My third requirement for government is to change our school systems to encourage and provide money to create democratic schools within large mainstream schools. This is slightly different from the 20% idea. These would be schools within schools, SWS. They would offer parents, students and teachers the choice of a democratic school as a separate unit within a large conventional school where self-directed learning in a democratic and rights respecting environment would be the norm. Unlike the 20% wing, the school within a school would offer self-directed learning full time for those students who wanted or any mixture of the two as suggested by the unschooling school advocates in this conference. There's a history of such schools in the United States where inspired by the ideas of Lawrence Kohlberg and his vision of just community schools, a number of schools within schools were created within large high schools of Brookline and Scarsdale in Boston, for example. Recently, the idea has begun to spread to Europe, and we've got one or two similar schools uh, in, in England, and that there's one in Tallinn in Austria. Um, the schools within schools are essentially the democratic schools, which we know and love, but have to meet the interesting challenge of existing in the direct proximity or even sharing a building with a traditional authoritarian school. Managing the interface between the two can be difficult and exciting as Charlie Moreno Romero is learning at his Suvamai school in Tallinn in Estonia. He's going to be talking about it tomorrow. Suvamai, by the way, is an Estonian. It translates into Summerhill School. I don't think that's a coincidence. Anyway, Charlie's running a workshop tomorrow, which I really recommend to you. Anyway, I'm out of time. And just before I close, having set out what's wrong with um, what we have and made some suggestions as to how we can move to a better place, I would like just to end on a quick note that gives me great hope. All around the world, inspired by that wonderful 16-year-old Swedish girl, Greta Thunberg, we are seeing a demand from change coming from young people themselves. In England, it's led to two campaigns entirely organized by young people, one called Teach the Future and another called Pupil Power. In the face of the challenges of climate change, 
they're demanding a more relevant, joined up and student directed school curriculum that addresses both climate change and social inequality. And they are demanding that their schools should become fully green establishments. The schools should also become the base for action in their communities to produce a more sustainable way of life. This fills me with hope because these kinds of groups of young people are emerging all around the world and we should do everything we can to help them to get in touch with each other and to support each other. Anyway, thank you for listening. Anyone still there? Um, I, <laughs> I I there's, a, there's a request in the chat, Derry, uh, asking if you'd be willing to provide the text of the talk you just gave. I know much of it's from your book, but some of it isn't. And, and people are still going to buy the book. They just are wondering. <laughs> I have the yeah. text here. I'll, 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 uh, I'll tidy it up into a Word document and send it to the conference. Is that Perfect. okay? Veda, are you there? Would that work? If I send the text of the talk to you, can, yes. you, can you give it to anyone who wants it? Sure, sure. I must tell you, a funny thing happened to me at a conference a couple of years ago. I was supposed to have a one hour slot. And when I got there, the previous speaker went on much too long. And I was told, please, Derry, could you do your talk in half an hour? And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to chuck half of it away. What I decided to do was talk very quickly. <laughs> and at the end of my talk, some lovely people came up to me and they said, uh, we are from Moscow Film School. Please, very interesting talk. What was it about? <laughs> so I hope I didn't speak too quickly. I'm sorry if I did. But yeah, I'll send a, a, the text of the talk to Vader. Do we have time for a couple of questions? May I say something? I think we've got quite a bit of time. Jerry's on at four o'clock. Vader, can you hear me? My yes, I can hear you. I, I just want to mention that I have a talk on Sunday evening, evening Berlin time. I don't know where you are. It, uh, it's about 6 p.m. Uh, London time. <clears throat> and it's about changes in the regular or uh, conventional school system. And I have included the second suggestion of Derry because I have talked with him a long time about these issues. And I have uh, developed together with some other people from uh, European Democratic Education Community, UDEC, a list of 15 points which, has, which can be changed or should be changed in regular schools to, towards human rights for students in, in school at all. And I would be happy to have you there to discuss it because it's just a suggestion. It's not a final list, but it's a starting point for uh, making offerings or proposals for regular school headmasters or the lawmakers of different countries. It should be a universal approach. And I would be happy not to be alone here. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll be there, Mike. Can, can the meeting details be put on the chat, please? The gentleman who just now spoke. Mike, did you hear him? He, Mike, he, can you he put wants you to the put the details on the chat to your to your talk. Can you put the link on the chat? <laughs> Sounds like a lot of people want to participate. Wir hören dich nicht, Mike. Du musst dein Mikro anmachen. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to switch on the mic. Uh, my talk on Sunday night is on the regular program of the Web IDEC. So it's there. I could copy it now, but I think it's uh, with my name, you will find it. It's, it's there on the website. Anybody who is interested can find it immediately. Okay. Just type M-I-K-E Mike, and then you will get to see him. Okay, thank you.
let's go ahead with the question and answer session with Devi. Can you take the questions, Liz or Veda? Sure. Oh, there was a couple in the chat. Yeah, there was a couple in the chat about um, focusing on uh, natural learning uh, and 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 learning from nature. Do you want to speak to that at all? They weren't direct questions. They were just comments that, that honored uh, what you were saying about integrating subjects. And then somebody else said, you know, can you can you please? Uh, remember to talk about natural learning and learning in nature. So that, that was one, you can address that or not. And another was, uh, and I don't know if I'm saying the name properly, uh, Zosha from Poland, is it Zosha? Yeah, um, <clears throat> appreciated your comment of, you know, about how to sort of get government on board, uh, but you know, relayed that that's certainly not the case in Poland right now. Their current education minister is a, homophobic and also uh, promotes child abuse. So, oh my goodness. What do you do with a, a, a in a government situation like that? Well, there, there is a question to you. Not very fair, I might say. <laughs> say it in a few words, Sosia. <clears throat> What's okay, that? so uh, just a few words. I don't want to become too political. This is not the forum for politics, but we've been having problems with the government who is kind of like authoritarian minded. And I think they were trying to provoke us uh, by nominating this man who, uh, first of all, he's not educator. His name is Czarnek. I will type it up on the uh, chat so you can check. You don't have to take my word for it. But he is a homophobe by his publicly uh, voiced comments, uh, and uh, he's also he also favors you know like spanking children. Huh? Uh, so we really don't know what the intention of the government was uh, nominating him the next minister of education. But just uh, that's what's 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 happening in Poland is that we had a very nice reform about uh, 15 years back of the mainstream education system. Uh, and it was heading towards the openings, uh, giving schools more autonomy. And then gradually the next <laughs> government started to narrow down the options. And then with this present current government coming in, uh, the options are really for very state controlled uh, uh, system. Mm, and that's what's happening. And that seems to be happening not only in our country, uh, that also seems to be exactly to be happening in a few countries which also had instituted their uh, democratically uh, winded reforms several years back, like Mexico, Peru, uh, Russia, uh, and Portugal. I know that from a conference, international conference taking place several months ago. So it seems to be like an uh, international trend. Sorry, I'm sure. Yeah. Up. I, I, I... I mean, my advice would be, I know in some of the countries you've just mentioned, <coughs> the more creative schools that emerged during the, the liberal times, some of those schools survive. So what I would say to a young teacher looking for their first job, or for a teacher who's very disillusioned in another school, is go and find one of those schools and make that small team that's trying to keep the flame alight, help keep it alight yourself and make sure that your personal flame doesn't go out. It's very difficult to be on your own without friends in this kind of environment. So stick together is all I can say. And if you can keep a bit of the flame, the light, it will have an effect on the kids. Those kids will not, I would bet, grow up as followers of the kind of regimes that you're talking about. And uh, I mean, I noticed there were several people from Hungary here earlier, and my God, they've got the same problem. There was a question, sorry, about the natural environment. Could, can I have that one again? Nature and ecology. Oh, nature and ecology. They are so important. And these kids groups now who are emerging with Teach the Future absolutely want the schools to become places where you can actually grow food. I did that in a small way. In the second school I worked in, the school was only half built when we went there and there were very large areas of land that weren't laid out for sports grounds. They weren't being used at all. 
and a bunch of kids got together from from the second year committee and decided to grow a pea patch and they grow they grew rows and rows and rows of peas and then when the peas were ripe made, bagged them up and took them round to uh, old people in the town who hadn't got a lot of money um kids will respond to this kind of thing um yeah i completely agree i haven't been terribly ecological in my own work and mea culpa you know it's important hi daddy hi daddy good evening hello <laughs> wonderful Ooh, wonderful as usual uh, is my voice clear to you and all yeah and look i apologize i've just found in the chat i didn't read it while i was talking several people said they couldn't hear me very well i'm really sorry about that i hope you could sort of no, get subs it. subsequently uh, i think the volume was okay oh okay good it was all right great and uh, dari uh, i am pretty impressed by your touch on integrated learning point number 1 and uh, government's participation now on the matter of integrated learning uh, obviously all of us have to be of the strong observation that uh, see nature in nature every subject is absolutely interconnected whereas it is in the school and the college and the phds that we do we learn in isolation and when you learn in isolation you have a problem observing the integrated element so i would like to have more of your experience in this direction well i completely agree with you and uh, of course if if you genuinely hand the curriculum to the students and follow their interests and passions um it might go in a hundred different directions but uh, i agree with i don't know if you heard stuart grower's talk earlier in the week stuart talked about being socratic of making sure you ask a lot of challenging questions to to the students i think that is terribly important and it's what i did as a matter of course rather than marking it or giving it a grade i would just try and come up with an intelligent socratic question that caused them to think a little bit more deeply about what they're doing and of course i think ian cunningham said earlier in the week that the subjects are quite artificial you have to ask yourself the old latin question cui bono who benefits from this ridiculous subject based system that we've got well the universities do they sit on top of it all with their subject departments really forcing schools to prepare a tiny minority of the kids for university but a whole lot are forced through the same regime because of them another group of people who benefit from this are companies and i'm going to name one because they're the worst um pearson are awful i think at trying to maintain the status quo because they make so much money out of the examination and and textbook industry um we have an examination at 16 plus called the GCSE in England it serves no purpose whatever and yet millions and millions of pounds are spent on it and the kids are worried sick to get high grades and the school is judged by the grades that the kids get and the teachers are judged by the grades that the kids get and this is all for the benefit of the examination industry i call them the testocracy and they've got to be faced up with and dealt with there was no need for any examinations it seems to me until you come to the time of school leaving leaving 18 or 19 it is in most countries and um, and there again i i mean i loved you know the approach to graduation that they use at sudbury valley school i love that the student has to persuade the school meeting in order to graduate but they're ready to leave school and go and live in the wider world that's about it <clears throat> people often say to me but we want the people are built to build bridges to build bridges that don't fall down so we need technical competence and of course we do but we don't need to force that right back down to little kids in schools and from your experience to what extent uh, were you uh, instrumental in convincing the government in any aspect of democratic education oh i had been successful actually 
I have got created a few policy changes just by chance in this country. Do you know the old Irish word? I'm trying to say, is it Srinivas? Srinivas? Yeah, Srinivas Kumar. Srinivas Kumar, right. Uh, call, a, call me Sky for convenience. There's a love, okay, Sky. There's a lovely old Irish word called serendipity. And just by chance, I found myself in the right place at the right time to affect policy. Um, in the year 1999, <clears throat> we had a change of government two years before that, but the Minister of Education was a, a man called David Blunkett. He was blind and he'd always been underestimated at school and he was determined one day to become Minister of Education. One of the university teachers who'd helped him was a politics teacher called Bernard Crick. And uh, David Blunkett said to Bernard Crick, when I'm Minister of Education, I'm going to summon you to the ministry as my chief assistant, and we're going to create a proper citizenship program, which we'd never had in England. Now, just by chance, I was advising Bernard Crick when Bernard Crick was asked to advise the minister. I was working for the Council of Europe, running democratic citizenship courses in different countries. And my message was, if you want kids to learn about democracy, they've got to do it, not just listen to teachers talk about it. So I was able to say to Bernard Crick, this is what we need to do. We need to introduce some democracy into schools. He persuaded the minister and the minister agreed with him. I couldn't believe it. So into the law came all secondary school students in the United Kingdom in state schools in England, sorry, not the United Kingdom, will have the opportunity to take part in democratic decision making and responsible action. Became part of the law. But while it was going through Parliament, the chief inspector heard about it and wrote articles in the right wing press saying this is ridiculous. Kids are going to be making democratic decisions when they should be learning more math. Um, so the minister got a bit panicky, didn't like being attacked in the press. And he said to Bernard Crick, do we have any evidence that democracy in schools doesn't undermine examination results? Bernard Crick said to me, hey, Derry, <laughs> do you have any evidence, your inspector, that this isn't true? So I carried out a research project. I looked at 3,500, I didn't do it all myself, um, secondary school inspection reports, and I found 20 where the schools were clearly trying to be more democratic than most. Those were in inner cities, in rural areas, and some in nice leafy suburbs. So what we did, we compared the examination results, the attendance figures, and the exclusion figures for those schools with the average for all other schools in the country in similar socioeconomic environments. Guess what we found? The examination results were better in the more democratic schools than you would have expected, especially for lower ability working class children and especially for the boys. The attendance figures were better than average in these more democratic schools and the exclusion figures were almost non-existent, even in inner city, very troubled areas. The reports online it's called the Hannam Report. You can find it a bit embarrassing, but it got called colloquially, it got called, it's got a long official title, but that's what it found, that the more democratic schools, even in conventional terms, get better results than the less democratic schools. And uh, uh, another this... one, one minute, I'll just give you one more quickie. And that, my later opportunity was to persuade the minister to change the law to allow school students to sit on governing bodies. They're the equivalent of school boards um, in North America. And again, what we found, there's a bit of research on the internet that I did, it's called I Was a Teenage Governor. Not happy about the title, but I didn't write that. But what we found was that schools that started including students on the governing bodies, the chairs of the governing bodies said they began to make much better decisions when they listened to the young people. So there's two examples. This um, Hennem report ha had also an effect on some democratic startups in Germany because uh, it was, was used to show that democracy is a good thing and that um, students will learn um, the academic subjects as good 
uh, if not better than students in traditional schools and it helped some of the democratic startups in Germany to 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 um, to get the permission it was uh, it's a good idea to have such a study in in your back. That's fantastic. It's Henning. I can't see your face, but I recognize your voice. Yeah, it's me. Yeah. Henning from Berlin. I didn't know that Henning. That's really nice news. Thank you. I've got a question, Derry. This is Thomas uh, equals Sudbury. I'm happy to cheer for Sudbury model schools. I was lucky to visit the campus one time also. My Sudbury school was in California, Santa Clara, and it closed about 10 years ago. However, I just have a quick question. I've read books by A.S. Neal also. I think I heard you say, Derry, that when you were young, one of the first things that opened your eyes about democratic education was by reading A.S. Neal's books. Is that correct? Did I hear you say that? Yeah, when I was at the teacher's college and I more or less got thrown out for asking hard questions at the psychology course, I got sent to the library um, to, to make my own studies in psychology. And one of the books I found on this dusty shelf that no one else was reading was all of A.S. Neal's books. And I just read the lot. I mean, it was like eating ice cream when you were five. Beautiful. Well, my real question is how lucky you were to have everything flow in that direction to put you in front of that shelf to find those unread books. If I hadn't been a difficult bugger in the psychology class, I wouldn't have got thrown out and I wouldn't have found the books. But life's like that. Um, Somebody said to me the other day, they said, oh, well, they just read my book and they said, isn't it amazing that all the bits of life, even though they seem boring and even painful at times, in the end, the whole thing sort of adds up and becomes coherent. And I have to say, she was 40 year old and said, it's just, I can just feel it beginning to happen to me. Maybe kids who've been to democratic schools can make this process start and make sense right from the word go. I don't know, but it's taken me a long time. 81 next birthday. I think it took A.S. Neal a long time also. And I just want to share real quick, just a few seconds here. When one of his books, I think it was a biography somebody else wrote, it described how A.S. Neal was beaten by a mob in Germany because he was an Englishman at the ramp up to World War I. And I'm also aware that Mahatma Gandhi was beaten by a crowd in South Africa because they thought that he was bringing in uh, other uh, uh, people from India and threatening their immigration problems. So there's something about being beaten by a mob that kind of turns people <laughs> in an interesting direction. That's kind of a joke. Thanks, Thomas. Derry, I wonder if I could ask a really just a quite a boring practical question. Um, I've been given the opportunity to start a new um, group hi, for... Um, hi, Derry. Hi. Sorry, I, I had to <laughs> your face appeared. Yeah. Um, I've been given the opportunity to start um, a new group for home ed kids um, one day a week um, in an indoor space, um, which, you know me, I like being outdoors. But we've got an indoor space. Um, and I'm just, I'm thinking of running it as like an equivalent of a, a democratic classroom, but you know, doing the 20%, but with home ed kids who so do one day a week of their home ed life as a democratic group. Okay. Um, and I was just wondering um, if you had any advice about um, the group size um, and also the kind of staff, you know, the kind of adults that it would be useful to have on hand. Group size is a really interesting discussion. Um, when I was uh, sort of vice principal of a high school, ended up as acting principal for long periods of time, there were 900 kids. Um, we divided it into five parts, basically. And then those five parts were divided into tutor groups of 23, 24, 25 of mixed age, 11 to 16. Um, and the six form, the older students, because they were doing a separate examination, preparing for university, had their own separate bit of the school. Um, I Somebody talked about this the other day. It may have been Stuart Grower. It may have been Peter Gray about optimal sizes. I found that around 200 was manageable for the whole community. And apparently, psychologically, there's some truth in that, that if you have a group of about 200, everyone can remember who everyone else is. So if you want to feel a part of community, you need to know who everybody else is. 200 seems to be around the right number. For a 
a kind of collective, a class or whatever you want to call it, a tutor group. 25 mixed age seems to work quite well. For actual working on projects, um, I got the impression that, I mean, some kids just want to work on their own and they've got some bee in their bonnet that's quite unique and nobody else wants to study that stuff or do that project. And I'm perfectly happy for them to work on their own. But I think ideally there's a lot to be said for developing collaborative skills. I think kids are naturally collaborative, you let them be. Um, small groups are nice. And uh, in, in my second school, when I had these vast numbers of kids in the humanities department at a time, I reckoned that groups between four and six were good. And we thought the staff team, which was about 10, which I think is the maximum that a staff team should probably be, so that everyone can take it in turns to chair the meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in these small groups, we identified different types of kids. Now, I don't know if anyone else has ever done this, but some kids do seem to naturally throw up leadership qualities in many situations. Whereas other kids demonstrate leadership qualities in just one or two very specific situations. But then there's another kind of kid who doesn't seem to have the I'm very skeptical of this because it's used in our military, these leadership qualities. But um, nonetheless, I think there's some truth here. There are some kids who don't really demonstrate any kind of leadership qualities, but they have something else that's very precious. They're kind of catalytic kids. That if, if you have a group where there's loads of arguments going on and one of these catalytic kids joins the group, people start to listen to each other. I've seen it in adult groups too. Some people just seem to have the skill and the patience to create a kind of aura around themselves and other people just stop being so bossy and start sharing. Sorry, that's a pretty convoluted answer, but 200 maximum for a school community. I've heard that figure mentioned, for example, Hadira School, when I visited it, had originally been about 200, but when I visited, it was about 320. And the staff were generally saying, this is too big. When they all go to the parliament, it doesn't work. There's just too many of them. And when I was at Sudbury Valley, Mimsy and Danny said to me, um, they thought that I, I, the school had dropped to below 100 at one point. They thought that was too few for there really to be much opportunity for kids to stimulate each other. On the other hand, they'd been up over 200 at one point and that they, that they were sure that was much too big and that they thought around 150 was probably ideal. I don't know if that any, is any kind of answer to your question. Qualities, Lucy. Oh, how the hell do you find the right people? Yes. Well, I think you produce the right people by having training environments. And I was listening to Crystal Hartkamp from uh, Hardewijk Sudbury School in the Netherlands. They've become a kind of a training school, or they had, they've moved it now. They've closed it in Hardewijk and moved it back to Amersfoort. But they talk a lot or Crystal talks very intelligently about how people come into the school not being quite sure how it works and gradually over time learn to handle it and in my experience of working with teams of 10 in these humanities teams you could take in two or three or even four people and they could kind of learn on the job one of the lovely things I mean I think teacher training on the whole is totally useless that's why I, I'm really impressed by this Economic Intelligence Unit publication, uh, Teacher Training for 2030. It's very intelligent and says a lot of good things, but most teacher training courses are a waste of space, in my humble opinion. Um, the best way is to learn on the job. What I found was when you had open plan situations or classrooms where the doors were open all the time, the kind of ethos of the teachers who are very competent at working in this felicitative way, their kind of aura would spread out into the other spaces and that the younger teachers didn't have to worry about control or anything like that because the more experienced adults in the situation um, provided cover, if you like, 
I mean, maybe this is a state school, large numbers person speaking and people from small Sudbury schools are wincing at what I'm saying, I don't know. But in my impression is that if you can put teachers into team situations, they just will evolve the skills that you need. But you've got to pick the right ones in the first place, Lucy. Um, I suppose you can try and poach them from other people. <laughs> I didn't say that. I think there are some skills we're looking for, though, and obviously being able to listen to young people is a terribly important one. And you can test that by just having them come into your situation and see how they relate to young people. Someone, got, someone else got their hand up. Bridget. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Jana's got so Liz, can you run the... Can you run my hands up? Uh, Bridget, we can't hear you. You're muted, Bridget. Can't, okay. There's something wrong. You might need to restart. Jana, did you have a question? Uh, no, I was just adding to uh, what Derry was saying uh, to Lucy that I think, you know, the ability to respect young people is probably the most important um, most important thing to look for in an adult and beyond that let the young people choose um they're, they're usually fantastic at, at choosing who they want to work with and who they want to have come back and it's not always who you think it will be it can be surprising sometimes of course the, the thing about the Sudbury school which is quite tough on the teachers who work it I don't know if yours works like this Jana but um do you decide at the end of every semester or at the end of every year which teachers are going to come back next year and for how many hours. And this is where the whole community um, decides who's fired, basically. And I've talked with a teacher um, who I thought was a great character who'd been fired from Sudbury Valley by the school meeting, not in any aggressive way, but just we don't what you bring to us, we don't need it next year, <laughs> which actually could feel pretty hurtful. Um, do you work in that way, Jana? Oh, and there's Crystal. Crystals yep. are running. Yeah. Yes, um, the, yeah, there's always a vote at the end of the year. Uh, and when somebody's coming in new um, at, at Riverstone, I mean, this is just a Riverstone thing. Um, initially, the meeting gives them feedback every week um, and then every month. Um, but at, at any point, that feedback can lead to them just leaving. So, yep, um, if you're not serving the community, you're not serving the community right now. Can I and you've just, you've a... just got to live with it. <laughs> Can I add just a, a couple of sentences to that? Uh, one of the highlights of my life was being approved to be a paid staff person at the Sudbury School where I was. And knowing that uh, it was the young people dominating that meeting who had gotten to see me uh, enough because I was uh, asked to show up for several months before being approved to be on staff. And this, I, this is the favorite part of my story is just like, I was a staff person at a Sudbury school because I was voted in by the young people, the young citizens. And at any weekly meeting, I could have been no longer a staff person if the young people just took a mind to do that. So that's powerful. That's trust in the young people. Can I just jump in, Richard, and then I'll give you the floor? Because Derry mentioned two principles, um, or three, I guess, time, team, and territory. And I agree with all of those. And then later he made reference to trust. And we've heard trust coming up time and time and time again here. I would also argue that, and maybe trust is part of team, Derry. I don't know. But I'd all, I'll almost argue that there needs to be four Ts. Trust is essential for any of what we're talking about to happen, not just trusting each other, but trusting the process, right? I've just added it to my list. Thanks, Liz. Okay. You're Richard? right. I completely agree. You're muted, Richard. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, I wanted to comment on, on what uh, Thomas just said as a staff member at Sudbury Valley School. And actually, that, that process to me is um, one of the things that, that concerns me about that model, uh, that teachers are left in, 
<clears throat> in such a, a tenuous situation. I, I feel that we need to be looking at teachers as uh, also children of the universe. They, they need to, to have a, a little more security, especially if they have families, than, than to be uh, just on the cliff of, a, of an assembly meeting. And so to, to cultivate the idea that, that whoever they take on at the school, whoever they vote in at some point, that they become part of the, the community. They're not just tenuous. And if it's a, a healthy community, those teachers are gonna fit in. There's a reason that they were voted in in the first place and they grow with the community. And, and it also is um, an opportunity to realize that, that adults have their ups and downs too. So that if there's a, a year that they're going through hard times, family breakup, health problems, whatever, that, that they're not dumped out of their job as well. And so I, I think we need to look a lot longer at, at that particular side of, of the Sudbury Valley operation uh, than just um, the idea of, of giving the, the youth power. We also have to, to give them sensitivity, compassion, and, and that kind of thing. Thanks. If I could take a, a second, Richard, uh, all you're saying is very important and true, of course. However, in the Sudbury model, there are no teachers. It's not like you're being fired because you're not a good enough teacher. You're not a teacher to begin with. And the most important thing is to fit in with the community, right, as a community member. So that's a very important uh, distinction when it comes to the Sudbury model. If I can just follow on that, I, I think, Thomas, can you help us out here? Because my understanding is that you were a paid staff member there as a, an older person and that you could lose your job in, in a moment, basically. Am I wrong can on I, that? Um, can I also add something? Um, because we have, we have a Sudbury school as well, and we, we have the process of staff elections every year as well. And, um, but it's a whole process. Don't, don't think about it, that it is a, a, a one-time, uh, everybody goes to a voting per place and, and can fill in whether he likes a person or not. Um, what you do is you have a whole process of uh, a staff um, uh, committee where students can also join in the staff committee and you discuss the functioning of the persons in the school. And it's all about how, um, what is the contribution of a person in the school? And if you are, if you have a good staff team, you don't need to worry because uh, most of the staff uh, do their tasks. They do their tasks as properly as they can. And of course there are flaws, but you can give a staff member also uh, some feedback on perhaps, um, well, you, you, you make your, your errors as well. So it is also a kind of moment that you get a kind of reflection from the whole school meeting. Um, so we, those staff debates uh, in school meeting, they take place in school meeting before the elections and only the students in our school, only the students that are there during the whole debate are eligible to vote. Um, and that is also uh, part of the Roberts rules. So the Roberts rules tells you that uh, only persons who have been in the discussion can vote. Uh, and um, which means that everybody is there. They can hear how uh, the staff committee thinks about the staff uh, functioning. They can also add their own visions on what they think about what's, how the staff is functioning. And then there, uh, people are going to vote, and we've uh, have hardly had any real uh, difficulties with um, uh, uh, staying in the school as staff members because everybody knows very, very well that if they vote out certain staff, that uh, they also risk uh, a continuation of the school. Everybody knows that. Um, so it, it is such a um, much more in-depth process of um, uh, evaluating the persons who, whom you hire as a school meeting. Everybody in the school has a say whom we are going to pay the next year hiring as staff members in the school. And it's all about where goes the money. And students also have a say about where goes the money. And that means that they also have a say in who we are going to hire next year. 
Uh, but we've had examples a few times, examples of staff members who were voted out and they saw that coming. It wasn't that they, they um, that it came out of the blue because already the years before they, um, they were not really having a good functioning uh, discussion. The, the discussions about their functioning were already in the direction of uh, you really have to take care and you have to do something about yourself, about how you uh, work in the school and how you, you spend your time in the school. Um, Let me just do one, one follow-up. I, I like, Richard, uh, just oh, a second. Richard, thank you we've, for that. We've had someone called Delipa has had a hand up in the, in the participants list for quite a while. I'll put it in the chat. Hi, Delhi. Um, Hello, oh, um, yes. Right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Jerry, for inspiring in a very witty um, talk. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure I will enjoy it really, really more. Um, I, I have a question um, around Summer Hill. Specifically, um, because you mentioned that some of you will be more at some point going to be closed down. So I've been thinking about, I mean, some of you have been there for I mean, years, really. In Richard, you should in switch off your mic. Sorry, Dilipa, this is a question about Summerhill, but I didn't quite get it. Okay. Um, so my question is, uh, how did someone, how did some, how did someone who continue to function as a democratic school with no curriculum and exams and all that, given the given the rest of the UK uh, education system works? Okay. How does it stay outside? It, and it, not, yeah. the, the answer is with with difficulty, and it depends partly on the government that's in power at the time. That 20 years ago in the year 2000, 1999, the government decided to try and close Summerhill. Um, what the inspectors objected to was that children could choose whether to go to lessons or not. They didn't object to the programme of lessons. They couldn't because Summerhill, unlike Sudbury Valley, has quite a regular schedule, a timetable of quite conventional lessons. But what makes the school so different is that the kids don't have to go to them if they don't want to. And that was what the inspectors objected to. And eventually the case came to court. The inspection had been done so badly, they just assumed it would be a walkover. And if the inspectors said the school should close, it would close, and that was all there was to it. But the school fought back, took the case to court, took the inspectors to court. And it was quite fun for me because I was an inspector working with the Summerhill lawyers uh, against the inspectors. Uh, so I got copies of all the inspectors' documents and I knew how they should have done it and they hadn't done it properly. So it was possible to win the case in court and the inspectors were told to clear off and leave the school alone. The interesting side effect of that is because of all the publicity that came with the court case, the numbers of kids wanting to go to Summerhill actually increased. And so the school became much more financially viable than it had been for a long time. I think um, Zoe Redhead, A.S. Neal's daughter, and her son, Henry Redhead, who are now principal and vice principal, are giving a, are giving a talk at this conference. Peter, I'm not sure have they done it or is it still to come? Uh, no, it's still to come. Yes, tomorrow. Oh, yes, tomorrow. Well, Dilipa, can I recommend that you go to that talk and ask the question again? But from the official side, I know Summerhill achieves two things. It gives people like me working in the state schools the inspiration to carry on doing what we're trying to do. On the other hand, it's a perpetual thorn in the side of the officials because it shows that things don't have to be done in the authoritarian way that they are in most schools. It's what I call the pioneer of possibility. They show what can be done. You don't have to treat kids like factory farmed animals. Um, and that of course 
is slightly upsetting for the people in power. But go to go to Zoe and Henry's talk tomorrow. Good question. Thank you. I think Zosha. Uh, Where'd she go? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, just uh, for Dilipa and everybody. I remember there is a delightful mini series. Uh, I watched it on uh, CDA. Unfortunately, with Polish subtitles, uh, uh, but uh, it is a little fantasized, uh, but based on true facts. I think there you might comment as you were in the very middle. So the leap and all, oh, maybe that would also be nice for you to watch. I showed it to my students and they were absolutely, you know, wow, yeah. It's a funny film, watch it if you can get a chance. It's pretty good. Um, I have a gender change in the film. I'm a female inspector in the inspection team and I come to the school not as a subversive uh, on the side of the school. I come to the school as one of the hostile inspectors but I get converted by the experience of being in the yeah. school. And at the end of the film, you see me as a teacher working with the kids. I've left the inspectors and I've gone to work at Summerhill. Um, it's, it's good fun, it's good fun. It's not true in lots of ways, but it does get across the idea of freedom that the school provides. We have a, a question in the chat, Derry, um, from Perdita. Uh, most of the children study in the state school and the alternate models of school have a tendency to de-emphasize de the knowledge and skills that young people need to get past the gatekeepers of socioeconomic access. How do the democratic educators deal with this tension that they too have the right to be to the best of the democratic schools? Well, I think you should look at the books produced by Sudbury Valley School that follow up the students, the alumni from the school. And uh, what you say really isn't the case. <clears throat> that people who've been through, through this kind of experience know what it is they want to do and why they want to do it. And often that's quite impressive, for, for example, to university admissions tutors. Even in my own small way, <clears throat> when I had a sixth form in my school of 16 to 18 year olds, I ran it quite democratically. The teachers were all expected to um, break up the syllabus of the course into pieces that interested the young people and different young people in the group would take responsibility for, um, for learning about and teaching bits of the course. Um, also, if they hadn't got a lesson schedule, they could go to the chip shop and buy some chips or go home or do whatever they wanted to do. Whereas in most schools, kids this age were expected to stay in the school library supervised by teachers. We gave our students from 16 to 18 the maximum freedom we could. And guess what? When they got to university, they did not drop out. As many of the students who'd been to authoritarian schools made bad decisions going to university and ended up becoming dropouts. The students from our school never dropped out because they knew why they were doing what they were doing. And this is the biggest thing that you would hope to see in kids coming out of democratic schools. So I think I have to disagree with your question. I, I just don't think it's true. Um, we have about three minutes left. Derry, I think um, you're on till the hour, right? Well, Jerry's here, Jerry's next. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm just thinking anybody that isn't a member of IDEC that wants access to your book, I've mentioned you can contact Richard. We'll give uh, Richard a minute, a second. Um, also, you can put your email in here and we'll make sure it all gets to where it needs to go if, if you're not already in touch with IDEC. Um, Gary, cool. Richard would like a minute to talk about his conference. Are you okay with that? And then we'll give you the oh, last. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask him to do. Yes, exactly. The Ottawa okay. Conference, Richard, please. I followed up with a comment in chat too, just my view on Sudbury Valley Schools, the staffing of it. I, I think it needs to be more humane. Uh, at any rate, uh, Derry's going to be talking at a conference that we're having in Ottawa. On uh, It starts on November 20th, which is the, the UN's uh, World Children's Day. 
And it's uh, designed to be an example of, of how to mobilize or uh, engage a community in the kinds of conversations that we're having here. Uh, there's always the concern that we end up talking too much among ourselves and it's not getting out into the public. And this uh, conference is designed uh, precisely to pursue the, the route that we can take to expand the conversation into a really robust, broad conversation in the general public. I, I think that that's a key to getting the kinds of changes in, in a lasting way that we would like to see in and with, with the pandemic, to come out of the pandemic on track to a, a new normal, I think we need to get that kind of conversation going in the community. So that's the, the purpose of it. I'll put in a link to the, the conference material as it currently stands, and you can see if it suits you, and then you can register for it. If there are any questions, uh, you can email me. I'll, I'll put my email in this chat as well. Thanks for this opportunity. Well, I'd really like to thank everybody who came and thanks for that, Richard. I'll see you in Ottawa. Um, thanks all but for being very patient because it was quite a long story. Can't call it a talk. It was quite a Can long I, story. You're very patient yeah. and you're still here and the questions were great. So it all feels very worthwhile personally. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, Vida, are you, I, I will also... Uh, tidy up my text and uh, send it to Vida and it will be available for anyone here who wants it. Um, thank yeah, you very Derry. much for the conference for inviting me. It's been great. Derry, Derry. Thank you, Derry. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much and hope to see you in Nepal. Uh, when, I, when, we, when we met uh, last time in Ukraine, I invited you, but uh, you had uh, some problem, you had some issues, and uh, you said that uh, it would, I mean, you would be available virtually. So I don't know what, what will happen in 2022. Hopefully, we'd love to see you in Kathmandu as well, you know? Fantastic. Thank I you so much. So. I hope so, too. How is your wife? Is she good? <laughs> Hi. You there, Derry? Derry might have left, 